hello everyone as promised we are doing the video grand masters versus the owens defense in the first video uh, i wanted to do it but that video ran a bit long uh and i just discussed and went over the game between uh, the legendary paul morphy uh with the white pieces and reverend owen uh with the black pieces and that was the game ladies and gentlemen that uh, sort of put the opening on the map on an international level. Of course, E4, B6 uh, was played before. But that was the game that uh, brought its um, potential uh, to the world on a, a grand stage. Uh, after that, moving on, after the that game was played in 1858, the, uh, Owens defense was played uh, here and there. Uh, by players um, of lesser uh, strength than the uh, uh, top players of that day, like Steinitz and Shigorin. So the Owens defense kind of um, fell into uh, bad uh, repute, all right, amongst uh, top players. And um, there's many games where you see uh, the play with the black pieces, you know, get uh, playable, uh, if not equal position, only to lose later on. And uh, unfortunately, we often will judge games by result only and not actually look at the game. So in those early days, you see many, many losses uh, in the Owens uh, defense. But when you uh, further scrutinize the game, you can see that oftentimes it was just that the, uh, you know, the player on the white side, whether it was Shigorin or um, Steinitz or somebody like that, was just too strong for the player on the black side. All right. And so, needless to say, the opening fell into uh, disrepute, and um, you really didn't um, uh, see it, but very uh, rarely uh, throughout the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, 60s. And then in the 70s, there was uh, another resurgence of this opening um, brought on by the uh, British Grand Masters, uh, which... Uh, to me, that was like a golden age in British chess. A lot of strong British players came out in the 1970s. Tony Miles, uh, the uh, first uh, English grandmaster. Of course, uh, Nigel Short uh, is from that crop. Spielman, um, uh, Ray Keane, uh, you know, a little bit earlier, of course. And then, of course, before that, you had uh, some strong international masters and such. But... These players were very creative, and you saw the resurgence of some uh, offbeat, if not obsolete, openings uh, being brought back by the British players. One of them was the modern defense, okay? Um, it used to be called the Robots defense after German player, uh, Austrian player, rather, Karl Robots, uh, uh, G6, uh, uh, in response to E4. But now, you see, it was revamped um, in England, and now it's the modern uh, defense. And in that revolution of uh, reviving and searching for new ways to um, uh, play the black pieces, uh, you see these openings such as the English defense um, uh, after C4, E6. And here we have the revival of the Owens defense after E4 um, and B6. And again, so there were some notable victories uh, gained. Uh, with it, but then again, it's uh, popularity waned. So in this video, we're gonna look at grandmasters versus the uh, Owens defense and to see how it fared. And we're gonna look at just wins and losses, no draws here, okay? And we're not biased one way or the other, and we'll come up with our own conclusions at the end. Again, we're gonna be going through these games kind of quickly, light analysis because there's a lot of games, of course. And um, I would love to hear your comments uh, at the end. And please definitely subscribe. Press that like button so that uh, my videos can be uh, moved up in the algorithm on YouTube. Because I really do uh, want everybody to see this content. Okay, enough rambling on. Our first game takes place in 1975. Okay, at the Porto Rose uh, Lubanya. Uh, tournament round 14, we have the strong attacking grandmaster Dragoyub Vilimerick with the white pieces. One of the great attacking players, rated 25-25 at the time. 
versus Albin Planinek with the Black Pieces, who was rated 25-35. Game started off E4, B6. There's your Owens defense. Classical move D4, Bishop B7, immediately attacking E4, which is the main idea in this opening for Black. Bishop D3, giving White the defense of the E pawn, but at the same time allowing White to be flexible in his defense as the E pawn is attacked down the road. So instead of playing knight C3 and having to worry about the bishop uh, coming uh, to B4, bishop D3 allows the option to move the C pawn to C3 or, um, you know, choose C4 perhaps later on. Right? A little more flexible. Knight F6. So more pressure being put on the E pawn. F3. Okay. Knight c6, again, attacking the center. And remember, in any hypermodern opening, black or whoever's playing, whoever's allowing the opponent to uh, gain the big center must attack that center vigorously while it is still in its infancy, so to speak. Once the center gets solidified, supported, and the person gets their pieces out, um, space and uh, pawn preponderance in the center are definitely a real advantage. Okay, so it's up to uh, Black here to prove that this center is indeed a uh, suspect. And what Black wants to do specifically is fix the center, okay, so that it cannot be mobile. That's where the danger lies in the center is its mobility, its potentiality uh, to expand and move the pieces off the board, especially uh, in the opening, all right? So after knight c6, c3, so we have this old school uh, method of... Basically saying, hey, there's nothing you can do to take away my uh, pawn center. And what I'll do is I'll just simply develop my pieces around this and we'll claim an advantage later with our space. Planinic plays E5, again pressuring the center. This forces White to make a choice. He plays D5, so this kind of solidifies everything. And now we're definitely in the closed position. However, the downside for White, we could say, is that this bishop on D3 is uh, pretty much a glorified pawn at this point. Knight B8. All right. And now with the D5 pawn advance, we see a hole on C5. And perhaps uh, a piece can come out to C5 now. And notice also that this diagonal is a little bit weak. All right, so we see some hypermodern strategy in action. So basically to um, stop the uh, pawns uh, from being uh, vital, right, by freezing them, okay, holding them in place, and then either destroying that pawn center or just simply um, exploiting the holes around those pawns. So bishop e3, knight a6. Knight e2, c6, again, more uh, pressure against the uh, pawn uh, structure of white. Again, not letting white uh, rest here. Valimeric decides to capture. He could play c4 here. <clears throat> but again, um, a good move here is just bishop c5. Okay, and then perhaps later on, uh, knight b4. Again, playing around the holes that are left behind. So, at this point, we could say that black has already uh, equalized this position. d takes c6, and just like that, uh, black has uh, equal game for all intents and purposes here. Alright. b4. Okay, this takes control or keeps control uh, of the C file, excuse me, the square C5 for white. Now queen D7, bishop uh, C4 here, B5, of course, uh, queen takes queen could be played. Again, the game is pretty much equal at this point. Bishop B3, C5, A4, C takes, A takes, and now knight C5. So black finally gets what he wanted. C takes B4. Bishops come off the board. And queen uh, takes B5. So we have this symmetrical position. 
here black is just fine uh black has uh the bishop uh pair here and um the material is uh, pretty much equal on the board um only thing that white has to uh black has to worry about is this exposure of his queen knight b takes c knight b c3 queen takes b4 and now queen a2 as white is down a pawn there's really no uh good way to try to protect this pawn because for example after bishop d2 black can play like say queen b6 for example taking over this diagonal right here from uh, g1 to b6 and this is kind of inconvenient uh for uh white here let's say rook a5 knight d7 knight a3 bishop e7 knight c4 and then queen e6 and now white can castle and then maybe rook c1 now and you can see the game is just uh equal okay so there's some difficulties in the position um uh, for both sides here but uh, the symmetrical nature of the position um, doesn't really give any chances for either side here so here white chose to develop rather than uh, give up his opportunity to castle um, but that was an option so now white has to worry about this extra pawn on the a file and he figures he has enough firepower on that file to not really um, have to worry about it. But nevertheless, you have to be careful. Black wants to trade queens. And now after bishop d7, um, the attacking player Vilimirovic, uh makes what I feel is like a drastic move. And he plays... Queen takes c8. In order to understand this move, really, you have to understand what type of player um, uh, Volimirik, uh, Volimirovic was. Uh, he was kind of, he was like Tal, but uh, as, as far as like an attacking player, he was he was very, very aggressive uh, uh, player here. Uh, any, like, normal player probably would have just played queen d3. And again, the game is just equal. I'm not even going to continue the variation, right? Spending too much time on this particular game already. But since it is the first game, I just wanted to share some of these ideas. And again, you just have like a normal uh, uh, equal game here. So instead, um, Volimirovic goes for queen takes c8, bishop takes. And... He goes for brilliancies, basically. All right, and um, and kudos to him for having faith uh, in his calculations. But here, it just happened. It just didn't happen to work out, and um, he rapidly uh, fell into a lost position. Okay, as he was just down material. All right, and I'll just speed through these last moves, and. He just didn't have enough compensation uh, for the uh, material and uh, went on to lo lose the game. So the first game that I'm showing you uh, is a win uh, for Black. Although it is kind of, it's kind of dubious in that uh, Volimirovic Vlim made this, this move. Queen uh, takes c8. Okay, which uh, I don't think many players would have uh, won. But the important uh, aspect of this game is that Black did equalize in the game. Especially after at, by move nine, black is uh black is just fine here. It's not no no problems here. So it's not like black got lucky or something like that. Uh, he was equal, and at this point the game was still equal, as you can see. And black is up a pawn, although that wasn't uh necessary. 
So the first outing at Grandmaster level that we see in the modern era, we see that um, uh, Black uh, has um, represented the defense well in this situation. Uh, furthermore, we might want to add that this this um, uh, method of protecting the center by white is a little bit on the on the passive uh, side also. And uh, as we go on, um, just try to make a mental note if you see this particular uh, pawn structure again uh, from the white side. So moving on in our time machine to Genevieve 1977 we have Eugenio Torre on the white side rated 2550 and the Great Dane Bent Larson rated 2615 with the black pieces again we already know how we start out e4 b6 d4 bishop b7 and Torre decides to play knight d2 again it has similar ideas to bishop e3 excuse me bishop d3 which is to protect the pawn in a way that um, discourages black from pinning on b4, okay, with this bishop. And if need be, he can fortify the d pawn with this uh, c3 pawn. So same uh, type idea. e6, knight gf3, and now c5 here attacking the center, and here we go, c3. So... If there's an exchange, it's no big deal. Black, uh, white will still have his double uh, pawn center. Knight f6, more pressure on the center. Bishop d3, knight c6, castles, bishop e7, rook e1. So we see that white is solidifying uh, his uh, central uh, pawn preponderance in his space advantage. Queen c7, a3, and now Larson commits further in the center and now we have this move e5 here and now knight d7 now those of you who are familiar with the uh, french defense you will notice that this position is very similar to a french defense uh, advanced variation and um i would like to say at this mo this moment that one of the um appealing aspects to playing the owens defense is that it is very flexible that um, you can end up in positions that resemble the French defense, Alicon's defense, uh, some variations of, of the uh, Rui Lopez, and Scandinavian. So um, if you are familiar with a lot of openings, uh, and you can find your way positionally, if you have a lot of experience playing, um, this is a way to kind of um, maybe avoid uh, certain move orders and land your opponent in deep waters without... Um, or before he or she can even recognize uh, that uh, they are in deep waters. Okay, so again, if you don't really like playing the advanced variation against the French, now all of a sudden you're there or in a very uh, similar position strategically. It can be, um, you know, a bit of an unpleasant uh, surprise. So keep that in mind is the flexibility and also keep in mind this structure and position because uh, this is a position that you might see um, a little bit more than the one you saw previously. So knight d7, b4, typical French advance theme. Uh, this clarifies Black's um, statement and argument in the center. Hey, by attacking that pawn, either you're going to push or you're going to exchange on d4 in this game. Um, Larson decides to push and closes down the queen side. Um, now, this is um, white, excuse me, forces black to uh, now attack the pawn chain at f6. Right? Now that he's closed down the queen side. So usually when players do this with c4, they're planning on um, castling queen side, seeing that everything will be uh, closed down. All right, and usually they'll try to attack the center with f6 or somehow open um, on the king side, bring the rooks over and launch a king side attack with h6, g5, etc., etc. So these games are usually pretty exciting. After bishop c2 uh, by Torre, Larson followed suit and played uh, castle. Again, a king side castle can be played also. 
All right. But Larson wanted to fight. Who knows what the tournament situation was at the time. But he wanted to uh, create some more imbalance in the position. So knight f1. Rook dg f8. Knight g5. Bishop takes. Bishop takes. These are all strategic uh, ideas in the uh, French defense. Um, especially for white. The idea of uh, exchanging off the dark square bishops. Knight f8. And now f4 h6 bishop h4 king b8 we're gonna speed it up a little bit knight e3 uh, knight e7 and now bishop takes e7 queen takes e7 f5 so white achieves his break here queen g5 and now queen g4 both players get into this ending e takes bishop takes f5 and now knight e6 classical blockade of the e um, six square so now rook f1 concentrating on the uh, f pawn so knight d8 knight e3 putting pressure on the um, d pawn and the c pawn indirectly notice also that white uh, bishop is better than the dark square bishop all right. One of the downsides, if I could take this time to mention, of, of committing your bishop that early to a square like b6 is that it does give your opponent uh, a lot of information early on. Okay, you're putting your bishop there, and then he can strive to create a pawn structure that is going to be um, bad for you. So we see a lot uh, in this opening that... Sometimes that light square bishop on b7 will be trapped or out of the game uh, if black is not very careful. Because since you're committing it so quickly, the player will often, the uh, opponent will often uh, gear a strategy to play, um, you know, in a manner that will restrict the movements of that bishop or the potentiality of that bishop, if you will. <clears throat> rook e8, rook a e1, rook hf8. Bishop drops to g4. There's the blockade again, knight e6, and now knight f5. And again, this speaks to the strategy earlier of removing the dark square bishop because now there's nothing really to stop this knight from hopping into d6. And we can say here that white is definitely uh, superior. Knight g5, h4. Rook takes d6 by Larson, giving up the exchange. And again, the knight on d6, most uh, classic chess books would tell you that a knight on d6 is definitely worth a knight. Knight e4, again, we're going to move a little faster here. Nice tactic by uh, Torre. Forces f6, d7, rook d8. And now the rook is tied up to the defense of the pawn. Rook e3, king c7. Bishop f5, and now bishop c6, b5, bishop takes b5, and now the bishop is um, deflected off the diagonal so that white could conquer e4, rook d7, and now we see that um, white, although um, is down a pawn, he's up in exchange. And it's interesting because it reminds me of the Morphe uh, Owen game, actually, where Morphe was up the exchange, but he did not have the open files in order to really shine with his rooks, and he wound up losing. A couple of more pieces are traded off. <clears throat> and at move 49, rook e5, uh, Ben Larson had to resign. Rook is on e, the e file, king is cut off. This pawn would just shoot up the board. There's no way this is going to promote, obviously. And um, that was it. This is from um, Russia in 1980. Uh, Tashkent. And with the white pieces, none other than Evgeny Shreshnikov, creator of the Shreshnikov defense and a strong adherent of the French advance. Uh, variation. He actually wrote a book 
a book on it, uh, French Events, and also the Shreshnikov and C3 Sicilian. Uh, so he's a prolific uh, chess player and writer. He was rated 2570 at the time and going against strong gra grandmaster of uh, Vitaly uh, Cheskovsky with the um, black pieces who was rated 2595. Again, here's our opening. Shreshnikov chooses bishop d3, e6, knight f3 here, and there's c5 attacking. And notice we see this theme uh, already creep up several times. The idea of um, not placing a piece on c3, namely a knight, so that when the uh, move c5 is played by black attacking d4, there's a pawn there to um, back it up in case of the exchange. Knight e7, h4, knight bc6, a3. Already we can see that Shreshnikov is already setting up his favorite position, which is to go into a similar position to the French advanced variation. Notice h4 is played. Again, you'll have to be familiar with that position to understand what's going on here. h4 is already played because many times this knight will come here and h5 will be played. So Shreshnikov is already ahead of the game psychologically. a3 is played because after this exchange here, this knight will not be able to go here and uh, harass the bishop, and it also prepares a move like b4 uh, later on. So similar ideas to the last game. d5, e5, c4. There we go. So we have almost the exact same position. Bishop c2, h6, h5. All typical moves, and we can, for all intents and purposes, say we are in the French advanced uh, position. Now, again, notice the... Difficulties here for black with this bishop. Is, where is this bishop uh, going? Terrible piece. Again, by committing the bishop to b7 so early, right, as early as move two, white just simply geared his game um, uh, around shutting that bishop out. So back to the game. After h5 on move 10, queen d7. And obviously, um, really one of the few strategies that black employs here is the castle queen side and attack on the king side, um, you know, as a, as a counterattack. Uh, another idea for white, white sometimes will counterattack on the king side, uh, excuse me, on the queen side by playing move like b3 uh, here and opening this up, then playing a4, a5 and trying to uh, attack on the queen side also. Knight h4, queenside castling, bishop e3, so there it is, f6, attacking the uh, center, f4, fortifying the center, king b8, useful move, knight d2, king a8, and now g4. This is a great formation, uh, This uh, it's called a grip formation, there's probably other names for it, but this pawn constellation of from h4, to E, I'm sorry, from H5 to E5 is very nice and very strong constellation to have, especially in the end game. Not so much here, but in the end game. F takes, F takes, and now black strikes when knight takes E5. And you can see the pressure down the file here, and also. The idea is to open up this diagonal for this bishop. Shreshnikov, um does not want to take. And just plays bishop f4. Knight f7. Another idea. Again, we're not going to go into this deeply. Is knight d3 here. It's opening up the position. So knight f7 instead. So black has basically snatched a pawn. And we can say that the opening has worked out uh, good uh, for black here. The fact that black was able to do that. And at the knight c6, knight g6, rook g8, um, there's chances for both uh, sides here. Okay. 
White's White's king size is very very drafty here, um, but black at the same time has some significant holes uh, in this position. As you can see, the knight's just chilling on g6. Um, e6 is is weak, um, and he has a backward pawn there. Of course, in the e5 square is looking a little suspect. And again, we already discussed the idea about this bishop on b7 so both sides have their issues all right so the game is pretty much up for grabs but again let it say let it be known that black has equalized to queen e2 bishop d6 so the fight is on of course for e5 takes takes castles queen side b5 pressure being built up on e5 that's an important battle in the position bishop c8 Queen e3, rook d8, rook hg1. And black, excuse me, white wants to wants to get in g5 eventually. And open up another another front. King b8, rook e2, bishop d7, and there it is, g5. H takes, knight takes, and now knight h6. Knight goes back to f3, keeping an eye on e5. Now rook c8. And um ah, rook c8 looks a little suspect. Um, maybe knight f5 is more more legit. That seems like it has a pur more of a purpose to it, attacking the queen here. And maybe queen g5 here, perhaps, or queen d2. Maybe I like queen g5 a little better. And then perhaps following up. With knight, um, uh, knight f e five, yeah. Rook c eight seems like uh, black kind of was running out of things to do here. Um, or perhaps trying to reposition the rook to open up uh, attack on the queen side. Perhaps rook c seven and um, then come here. Or perhaps even rook c7 and then perhaps move this bishop out the way and add more protection to this uh, square. So queen g5, rook c7, rook ge1, and there it is. Yep, bishop c8, so queen h4, and now knight d8. And we can see all of this drama revolving around these squares e6 and uh, e5. Here, black is holding, but it's very uncomfortable for him, right? Because white is calling the shots basically. Knight g5, knight h7, some pieces come off, and now finally white solidifies his hold on e5 by putting a piece there. G8, and now. You can see the purpose of the move G4, G5 earlier, opening opening up another um, avenue of attack. And Shreshnikov is relentless. This The idea behind this move is just to penetrate into the black position, which he does. Now knight c6, knight g6, attacking the rook. Of course, if he goes here, then the, the queen drops. This forces the exchange of queens, and this is good for white because the end game is favorable uh, for white. Again, this bishop is horrible the whole game. D8, and finally, the pawn drops. Takes, rook takes, knight takes e6, and now this is exactly what black, um, excuse me, what white has been fighting for the whole game. Now he's one material. And Shreshnikov being the strong master that he is. Is not going to give black any counterplay here. And after B5. Tchaikovsky was forced to resign. So good game uh, played by Evgeny Shreshnikov. But again can we say that the loss was because of the opening? Nope. It's just simply... That um, black wind up 
uh, making some mistakes earlier uh, from position that was, you know, dynamically uh, equal. Okay, we say Black did not make the most out of his opportunities after this move. Knight uh, takes e5. Good game, if I might add. This game is between um, F.M. Geller, who was, um, was from the old school Russian era of the 1960s, and who was rated 25-25 at the time. With the white pieces and with the black pieces, the former women's champion, uh, Maya Shibunadza. Uh And this is from the Women vs. Veterans Tournament. It took place around 12 and 1992. Maya Shibunadza was 25.05 at the time. And um, going against the old veteran, uh, Ephraim Geller, who was, again had some fantastic games. Uh, great tactician. And we see in this game that he still has it. So bishop b7. There it is. Bishop d3. Again, solid. Right? Oldie but goodie move. And notice you haven't seen anybody playing knight c3. So it's pretty much, uh, you know, standard practice to avoid that move. So knight f3, g6. So we have this, um, I don't know what you call it, hippopotamus type setup. <laughs> With the double fianchetto of the bishops. Geller just plays his pieces out. Bishop g5. Knight c3. Finally here. Just old school classic. Uh, classic chess. Bishop g7. Castle. d6. So we have this again. Hedgehog, uh, hippopotamus, whatever kind of name you want to give the white's, uh, black's position. But white has a, a nice advantage here. Again, he has the, the two pawns together in the center, classical position, pawn preponderance in the center. More space as his pieces occupy the first four ranks. And if we want to count that bishop on g5, the first five ranks in the position it has more development, okay? Uh, Black only has his two uh, bishops developed, okay? If you've been watching my other videos, I have about 500 videos on my channel. You would know what to do when you have a lead in the devel in development, and that's open up the position. Sometimes that might take a sacrifice of a piece or a pawn, but if you want to exploit a lead in development, the position has to be open. Otherwise, the... Opponent will just continue to develop normally and your temporary advantage in development will disappear Rook e1 knight d7 e5 Okay, of course Shibunaza knows these principles also at the e5 she says nope We're keeping this position closed After d5 a4 by Geller he wants to open up another front so a6. So now if a5 by white, then just simply b5, keeping the position closed. And the game continues. Knight e2. Okay. Knight e2, knight e7. And now knight f4. So bringing pieces closer uh, to the uh, center of the board. It's the order of the day. And now knight c6. So there's some... Uh, minimal pressure on the uh, on the white center. Notice that this move can't be played uh, f6 because of this idea and pressure that's put on uh, e6 by the knight on f4. c3. Okay, so white simply solidifies his position. There's no counterplay now, say after knight b4. And... Um, Black pieces look foolish on the queen on the queen side here. But again, how do we exploit this? How does Geller exploit this situation? So a5. And now Geller starts to attack. H4, H6. Again, Maya playing it close to the vest. Bishop F6. So Bishop takes, E takes, F6. Knight takes f6, so it's like, hey, what's going on? Black has got a pawn. However, white has got a pawn too. 
and let the games begin. The king is caught in the middle of the board. Black is behind in development. And this game could have been played in the 1800s because all the principles are the same. Bishop takes g6. F takes g6. Rook takes e6 check. And now you can see the purpose of this knight on f4. Assisting an attack against the weak and light squares. Queen d3. Oh my god. Threatening queen takes g6. Rook g8. Rook a e1. Just more firepower. Somebody just stop the massacre. Knight e4. Still can't take the rook because the knight is protected here. Classic Ru Russian chess has given up the exchange. Rook, t rook 1 takes e4. Removing defenders. And then after queen c4, Shibunadze had enough because this discovery this discovery tactics are going to be uh, brutal in the position. And that was it. So that was just a bad day at the office uh, for the uh, Owens uh, defense there. Our next game is, um, oh, and by the way, I'm leaving out uh, Blitz Blitz games also um, because those, anything can happen happen in a Blitz game. I'm trying to uh, just do um, classical and, and rapid, no no five-minute games and things like that. So you won't see uh, Nakamura's games on here, although he has a, a few. This game took place in 1985 at Lublanya, uh, the European Cup. And uh, English Grandmaster Peter K. Wells with the white pieces 2545 and with the black pieces um, Armenian Grandmaster Artash's uh, Manasian uh, 2565. And he was act he's an actual um, player that uh, actually specializes in the op opening, has few a few games uh, in this, this uh, system. So e4, b6, d4. Again, we're going to speed it up here. Again, you see. White's tried and true um, system against that. This time, you see knight c3 come out for the first time. So e6, knight f3, and there's bishop b4. All right, so this is exactly what black uh, wants. Is black better here? Of, co of course not. But again, this gives black um, the setup that he wants. Bishop g5, h6. Um White has to part with the bishop at this point because of the uh, pressure on the e-pawn indirectly. Queen takes f6, castles, and the bishop just comes back. Uh, after doing his job, the bishop just uh, comes right back home. The reason why it went all the way back to f8 is so that this queen um, can get out of dodge if it needs to. Has a place to hide. So queen d2. And just simply queen e7. All right. Now here, I not I don't really like Black's position too much. Uh, it's just awkward with the bishop just going back home. Now the queen is blocking uh, the bishop. And here, I I definitely prefer White's position. Okay. So again, just like Black doesn't always lose because of the opening, it's the same with White. If white has a loss, it's not because always because of the opening. Here, white is better. So d6 is played. And now here, um, Wells played bishop uh, b5 check. I like the idea of, of trying to begin to open up the position a la uh, Geller against uh, Shibunaza. He's playing d5. Of course, um, uh, Manasian would play e5, right? Being behind in development, he wants to keep the position closed. But I like pursuing that same idea. Even if you might later on down the road have to make uh, some type of uh, sacrifice to to get in the position and uh, exploit your lead in development, that's what has to be done. So like sample play could go a6 again with the idea... Let's say a5, b5, knight e2, with the idea of, let's say at the knight d7, then c4. Okay, and beginning to work on the opening of the position. And here, at least you have, now you have the open c file. Okay, so here, 
bishop takes c you know and let's say g6 and then you can do uh you know move like rook ec1 or something like that okay just for an example wells plays bishop b5 check knight d7 and now knight d5 so he's going for it all right obviously black is not going to take here because of the situation on the e-file this is a threat also Gaminasian is under some pressure and now knight b4 c5 and now here wells plays d take c5 a natural looking move of course open open up the position knight d5 is also um again on the tables again right with the idea of the bad situation on the e file the idea behind that is if e takes d5 not uh, not um, e takes d5 but e5 is even more deadly right we don't want to play that because then just simply bishop e7 but if you play e5 here then things get a little bit worse because now if bishop e7 e takes d6 and the piece is pinned so that's just one little uh, sample right there so d takes c5 is played b takes c5 and now wells opted for knight e5 which again the spirit is is right this attacking um attitude is correct but tactically uh, flawed this is another thing that players like to do that enjoy cramped positions is play in such a provocative manner that you kind of uh uh kill yourself basically by playing over aggressive and then fall into uh traps and this is kind of what um peter wells does here he has a, he has a great position um, and perhaps he should have played knight d5 here again, going back to this well, or um, no pun intended, or knight d3. However, he plays knight e5, and after d takes e5, rook a d1, his attack runs out of out of steam. Right, he has all this pressure on this knight, and he probably may have figured he would have adequate compensation. Right, I'm sure he saw all of this. But it just doesn't work out. It's black has just enough to uh, get out of this position. The knight c6, queen b6, uh, and black starts to unravel and counterattack. And that's basically the, the story of this game right here. And again, I'll just rapidly go through this game. Notice black gets out of the pin. So now on rook d3, the knight can just move. Bishop c6, and again, some nice attacking efforts by white, but just, um, again, the whole attack is, is based on a uh, miscalculation here. Now he's just forced to trade. And basically, he's going to lose this game um, because of a, a false attack here. Nasian trades off. And after G4, um, uh, White was forced to resign. So, a uh, good game by Black. Again, exploiting the opportunities. But let us say that um, White is definitely in a better position at the move 10 uh, at this point. Okay. And that White's loss uh, came from being uh, over ambitious of anything. And, you know, uh, making a miscalculation as we all do. So let's hop in the time machine. Here's another game from uh, 1996. And this is uh, from the Cannes Open. And with the white pieces, the player Drazen Cermak, 25-35. Again, Manasian with the black pieces. Again, we're going to skim through this. Notice the knight did not come to c3, avoiding the pin, but d2. Knight gf3 is played, c5, c3. D5, E5. So there's our formation again that resembles the advanced French defense. Queen E2, Knight C6, 
castles, bishop e7, rook d1, c takes, c takes, and knight b4. And this is what I was saying earlier that this is why this move a3 is played a lot of times in order to keep the knight from coming here and harassing this bishop. And also it facilitates the move b4 at times to resolve the central tension after the move c5 from black. So no big deal. Bishop b1, the rook comes to c8. Knight f1. And bishop a6. Again, all thematic play uh, from the French defense handbook. And black is perfectly uh, equal in this position. Although we have a long way to go in the game. And we can see the typical play here. Again, wanting to penetrate um, black's position that way. And um, white would like to use his advanced e-pawn to conduct the king aside attack. And if the attack uh, falters out, again, rely on his space in an end game, which is definitely very important uh, to um, uh, win the game for him. So we see slowly but surely white uh, kind of slows down what black is doing on the queen side. And he starts working on his attack on the other side of the board. You see white probing. And notice how white started implementing his own plan as he slowed down black's plan. So now this forces black to address the situation. On the other side of the board, again, strategic motif, exchanging the dark square bishops. This is very important uh, for white because the dark square bishop in these French formations um, is usually the good bishop, quote unquote. Right. Notice all the pawns are on light squares. So white got rid of his bad bishop earlier, which is usually a problem in that trade where I said he had equalized. But notice all the pawns of black are on white squares. So the dark square bishop is the only uh, piece that's really uh, technically assigned to, to protect those dark squares. Once that bishop is removed, there's many holes in the black position. And um, oftentimes a, a queen or a piece that's not really suited to protecting the dark squares must uh, take its place. Okay, so again, black is forced to defend himself on that side of the board. And very powerful tactic um, from white, which again is thematic. When you have a lot of pawns on uh, one color complex, it usually means there's weakness on the other color. So if you have all your pawns on white squares, it means that the dark squares are uh, weak and vice versa. Okay. And if you look at white's position, most of his pawns or all of his pawns rather are on dark squares. Well, his light squares are weak. Okay. It just happens to be that black is not in a position to exploit this weakness. But if we just look at the board from a static perspective, the light squares are weak for white and the dark squares are weak from black. The difference is white has that bishop on d3 and he's able to exploit the weakness uh, on the uh, dark squares. And if you don't believe me, pick up the book Zork 1953 by David Bronstein and... He says it in one of the games where he talks about color complexes that when there's um, pawn preponderance on a certain square, they usually that indicates the weakness on the opposite color. And here you see that in a uh, fantastic illustration. Bishop takes f5, rook f5. Of course, he doesn't want to take. Why doesn't he want to take? What happens? E takes e5. You get the powerful forced move e6 check. All right, queen takes e6, and guess what? Boom, queen c7, king e8, and rook e1. Game is over for all intents and purposes. Again, exploiting the weakness on the opposite color complex of the pawns. So rook f8, bishop takes, queen takes knight g5. Okay, so he just took the other pawn. And now knight g5, exploiting this pin right here. Black gives up the exchange. Remember, Manasian is a specialist in this opening, so he fights hard. Rook g1, f4, queen g6, 
course one and two check right there f5 e6 check and the pawns just come uh, running up the board and that is all she wrote and Manasian uh, had to resign uh, at that point so good game again by white um, just remember again this idea of this events uh, formation so get our next game this is from uh, Corsica Rapid Open 1997 Arthur Kogan with the black excuse me with the white pieces rated 2500 and Boris Spassky former world champion with the black pieces rated 2550 at the time get right into it I hope you're bearing with me and I know this video is long uh, yeah, feel free to pause it at any time or just watch the other half, or, you know, another day or something like that. But at least you'll have the whole um, compendium of um, of uh, games in the Owens defense. In this video, you can definitely uh, learn from better than any book or soft software because you're seeing the real deal. You're seeing it in practice. You know, if it's and you can judge for yourself it's, if it's good enough. So bishop d3 is played again. We already know. And this time 92. D6. And again, usually when moves like 92 are played or uh, knight bd2, there's a reason, right? And the reason here why this move is played is because obviously white wants to use this f pawn in some capacity. Maybe f3 to bolster the center or play f4 at some point. Castles, knight d7 f4 so here um it's a rapid game kogan decides to be a little more aggressive again in this position um i prefer white here i like white's position all right g6 boldness by kogan he plays f5 against basket anyway sacrifices a pawn wants to open up things g takes f5 again spasky being a little behind in development King in the middle of the board. What is he gonna play here? Is he gonna grab the pawn? Of course not. You can't. You can't make positional errors like that, right? Play e takes f5 is is almost suicidal. The knight g3. Instead, he just simply bypasses and plays e5, keeping things closed. Knight to g3. Knight g f6. E takes d4, bishop e7, and now a4, and of course, Kogan's no idiot, he's uh, he's already anticipating some type of effort to castle on the queen side, and he wants to be uh, ready, because he figures Spassky's not going to just castle over here with the you know g file open and things like that, Spassky plays a6 again, Gonna keep things closed. If a5, you just play b4. Rook e1 now. Rook g8 from Spassky. Knight h5. And this position is pretty double edged here. Knight e5. A lot of clutter on the e file. Also, although the king is there in the middle, it's hard to get to him. King d7. That's like a move that Shigorin would make back in the early 1900s. Right, just move the king. That's how you solve the problem, okay? He can't castle right away. Let's get the king off the file, and that's what he does. Knight h takes f6 check. Bishop takes, and now queen uh, h5 check. Rook g4 by Spassky. And now rook a d1. And this is a blunder because it allows the queen to uh, get trapped here. Again, it's a rapid game, so who knows what time scenario uh, it was. So g3 was uh, better. Now I did g3, queen e7. Knight f2, rook g, g8. And play could go like that, for example. We have a game where eh, you could take either side here. Maybe black is a little better. This position is a little messy uh, here. Instead, rook a d1 was played, a natural move, which looks like more like a, a move you will make, you know, over, you know, it's like an oversight. It looks so natural, right? Bring the piece to the, to the center, last piece to develop in the game. 
but it overlooks this move right here, rook h4. And after rook h4, the queen is uh, attacked. And uh, and underneath that is the bishop. So if the queen moves, then it's just uh, rook takes h6. So here, Kogan played knight takes f6 check, trying to resolve the problems. Queen takes f6, and now you have this piece doubly attacked. You know, via X-ray from the, with the rook, and now Bishop G5, and it looks like, right, on the surface that Kogan to solve this problems because he's gonna allow Rook takes here, and then Bishop takes F6, but Black has the initiative of the open G file, and this, ladies and gentlemen, um, is how it looks when things go right for black here in this opening right you have the pressure on the g-pawn the bishop is shining right the bishop's not all blockaded and um, out of the game okay this is exactly what black wants as Baski gets it so bishop takes e5 rook takes g2 king f1 d takes e5 rook takes e5 rook h takes h2 bishop b5 check king d6 and um uh black is forced uh excuse me white has to resign this bishop is protecting this uh rook on g2 so mate is coming up next only way to stop that is to play you know again start playing computer moves like rook e4 or something or bishop c6 so good game um uh from black here although white could have it definitely improved perhaps this move f5 was too ambitious early on in the opening. All right. So maybe after g6, just some more development. Knight bc3 or something like that. Bishop e3. All right. Let's get back in the time machine and get out of here. Here is another rapid from 1998. Lambit Ole with the white pieces, the late. Great Lembit Old, 26-45, young grandmaster at the time. Again, going against Boris Baski, 25-35. And we see a similar approach here from Lembit Old, Castles, and Knight D7. And here he decides to utilize the C-pawn here and gain some more space in the position. Boris Baski's playing this hedgehog or hippopotamus type position here. I see three. And just kind of hiding behind the walls of pawns while he develops his pieces. Remember again, this is a rapid game. So G5. So D5. And again, this has um, the idea of, again, blocking this bishop. This bishop is going to be bad. All right. Unless black decides to open up. The position, if black opens up the position, it could be bad because his king is still in the middle and white's development is better. So, Spassky decides to try to play around the pawns, right, via the holes in the uh, on the dark squares. Knight d4, queen e7, knight cb5, again, thematic. Knight c5, and now a5. That stops the move B4. So B3. And again, the strategy, um, again, Lambert decides uh, uh, here, and I know it's probably hard for you to tell here, but already the the idea is Lambert is deciding the, uh, he's going to play in the king side, or the queen side, rather. So you have B4 coming up. Black is forced to deal with that with A5 if he wants to keep this knight here. So then you have the slow attacking system of B3, followed by A3, and then B4. So this knight is pretty much doomed to have to move. He knows that Spassky wants to attack on the uh, king side, so he's not going to play play into that or play really on that side of the board. So let's see how things unfolded. So A5, B3. And now Spassky castles over there. And now a3. 
b4 knight b3 so b takes and now a takes of course the idea is if knight takes b3 then the rook is in trouble there so he just simply plays queen b2 and now we see black counterattacking the center now of course this bishop is still still bad f5 from Spassky O takes his pawn f4 bishop d2 g4 so fearsome looking attack um, on the king side of the board from Spassky rook ae1 even in his older age he still had these tendencies and now f3 g3 and h3 this closes up uh, the position and temporarily halts the black assault on the uh, king side so now Spassky plays bishop c8 and just like in the uh, classic king's indian uh, games the idea is of course to sacrifice this bishop here on h3 and open up the position what does old do he plays knight e6 so timing is everything right rook f7 rook e4 bishop e5 queen d3 so white is up a pawn here but he has to respect the black attack and so now he's just taking the proper uh, measures in order to make sure that there is no attack for black has to kill all the counterplay c6 c takes d5 c takes d5 and bishop d7 knight c6 and we can see the positional play in contrast uh positional play from white in contrast with the um vigorous attempts to create um an attack by black but positionally um white is just too strong here that knight on e6 is uh worth a lot queen f5 knight f takes e4 and just uh strong that when you when you see moves like this you know the game is over right knight takes f4 e takes f4 rook takes bishop takes rook takes nice uh exchange right there king h7 Clears the way for the pawn just to go. D6. Queen E6. Offering the trade of queens, of course. Bishop E1. Rook F5. And just D7. And Spassky had to resign. So good game. Good rapid game by both players. Um, going back to the starting position. I do like this position again for white. Again, having more space. Pawn pre uh, preponderance in the center uh, does uh, mean something. Um, but good execution of an attack by old good defense um, against Spassky's vigorous uh, efforts uh, on the king side. He definitely made a dangerous um, attempt at uh, conquering the white uh, side here. And uh, many lesser players might have succumbed um, to a, a brilliancy in that game. But I like the positional antidotes that uh game. Here's a short game from 1998. Uh, Hitchem Hamducci with the white pieces versus Giovanni Vescovi. And I'm not sure. I think this is a, a blitz game, but I didn't want to show it. So I'm going to go do it real quick. I'm not exactly sure. But the quality of play looks like that of a blitz game. So F takes E3. Bishop takes E4 here. Nice C3. Knight b5 and Vescovi plays queen b8 here, which is which is an error and allows this move queen f3 building up on this pawn here. You can see the knight is the only one protecting it. The reason why queen b8 is a mistake is because queen b7 at least allows um, the black king to get into safety after castles here. If knight takes g6, h takes g6, queen f7, and then uh, a, um, a6. Yes, white is better, but black has more chances than in the game. After queen b8, queen f3, there is no um, outlet for black, really. 
a6 happens so knight takes g6 f takes g6 queen f7 check now he just has to walk king d8 and he just loses a bunch of material and that was all she wrote with the uh white uh with the black pieces so like i said ter terrible game um uh, black but i think like i said i think it was just uh, um um uh sp uh blitz game Let's see okay here's a classical game again white pieces christian bauer 2517 black pieces at uh rated this is from the New York Open, round three in 2000. Again, I told you Manasian is a specialist in this. And we can see that he does not commit any pawns to the center. He's black. And uh, he's just attacking with pieces. So queen e2, e6, knight f3, and c5. How is um, Bauer going to react to this? Well, he just plays d5 here. With the queen on e2 is exploiting the fact that um, maybe black would be more reluctant to exchange here. But after e takes d5, e takes d5, check. Queen e7, players enter into this endgame. And c4, b5, b3, queen takes e2, king takes e2. This is an important variation as far as I'm concerned because... If black can easily just draw from here, then this is a nice this is a nice path that black can take at certain times. However, it's difficult to draw from here. Again, we run into a problem that we have run into several times already, and that is the fate of this bishop on b7. Bishop ends up in a, a suspect situation. It's a bad bishop. And it's basically like playing a piece down. Here White is definitely better already, even in this endgame. We're going to move it along here. Knight bd2, h6, knight h4, headed, uh, headed to uh, f5. And brilliant move right here, uh, found by uh, Christian Bauer. And again... As I said before, um, when you have a lot of your pawns on one uh, square or one color complex, excuse me, that means the other color complex is left weak. In this case, you have this pawn chain of pawns all on the dark squares. That means the light squares are left uh, weakened. And what Bauer does is he just simply takes away the defender of those squares. Rook takes e7. King takes e7. Rook e1 check. King d7. And now knight f5. Hitting another pawn on the dark square. And now he hits the d6 square. There's no way to defend those squares. Takes. Rook takes. So the rooks come off. Right here is black. Up the exchange but his pieces are tucked away undeveloped. Bishop a6, again, terrible bishop. Again, it's like playing with the piece down. And the rook is in the corner. So, And the knight is here. So the knight can't develop. Either way, the rook can't get out. And the bishop has nowhere to go. This, my friend, is probably, or friends, is probably one of the best games in this variation um, that I'm showing today. Just because the fact that it's in the end game and white completely ties black in this position down. Completely ties black up. He trades off his last active piece. Bishop c8. That's all, all he can do is move back and forth. Knight takes c5. Check. King e8. It's almost like a Zug's wing. Knight e4. Bishop d7. So he finally gets out. But it's too late. Now you have the C and D pawns running up the board. Knight D6 check. Knight C4. Knight A6. Again, the pawns running up the board. Bishop E8. Knight B6 hitting the rook. And there's really 
nothing to do with this rook. Uh, I mean, what do you do? If you go try to preserve the rook somehow, rook d8, then just simply bishop a6, right? Because the knight is being protected. If you try to go here, then knight c8 is a fork. Okay, um, so that explains black's move, knight c5. The knight c5 attacking the bishop right here. Of course, Bauer just simply played bishop c4 and Manasian had to resign. And that's a 30 mover right there. And again, that says a lot to me because first of all, it's a classical game. And second of all, I know that Manasian with the black pieces is a specialist uh, in this, this opening. Another classical game, Alexander Ivanov, Grandmaster. Um, if you live on the East Coast, up um, in uh, near New York, Tri-State area, Connecticut, New Jersey, um, Pennsylvania, you might have seen uh, Alexander Ivanov at numerous tournaments. It's like that guy's been around forever. At this time, uh, he's 25-41. He's at the World Open in Philadelphia, going against Grandmaster Pavel Blatney. Who was 25-12. Also another specialist in this opening. And kind of other offbeat uh, type of openings. There's a video of him. I have uh, Maurice Ashley playing against Pavel Blatney. Actually in a, a modern defense. This day. B6 was played. In round 5 of the World Open in 2000. Grandmaster Ivanov played D4. Bishop B7 again. We already know the routine. Knight d2, e6, knight gf3, c5, c3, knight c6, a3. Again, you see this move. Usually, the player is opting to go into this kind of French advanced variation as soon as d5 is played. We saw this uh, story before, haven't we? e5, knight d7, castles, a5. And now, again, this is a similar line in the French whereby many times black will try to trade this bad bishop off, right? Also, what the move a5 does is it hinders this move right here, and it kind of changes the strategy a little bit, whereby um, after a5, white will just play a move like b3, and sometimes play for the move c4 at some point. b3. And needless to say here, well, let me let me uh, say that the game is equal here. So don't think that white has some type of big advantage. It all, it's all about the positions that you like to play. If you're comfortable in a certain position, by all means, go for it. Because um, unless it's a huge advantage, the equal or slight advantage, all that stuff doesn't really mean too much unless it's something um, really tangible at the moment and uh, outrageous. Okay, it's, it's mostly about where you feel at ease at and comfortable. I like these kind of positions personally as white. So queen c8 is played, so black is preparing to trade off that bad bishop. Bishop b2, bishop a6, queen e2. Again, white, you know, uh, allows this equality, but he's saying, hey, I'll, you know, I got more space and I like this position. Queen a6. Queen a3, and now a4, c4, d takes c4, d5. Okay, this is kind of unpleasant. This is exploiting the fact that the white king, uh, excuse me, the black king is unsafe where it's at. So, knight d4. If he plays e takes d5, uh, it's bad news after e6. Um, so let's say f takes e6, queen takes e6, check. Okay, this guy is hanging, so knight e7 and knight g5. These are all like uh, brutal moves, like for instance, so after castles, everything is just gonna um, come open. Let's say d4, then you got knight f7 here. If you play rook g8, then you could just continue on with the move like rook a d1. 
and let's say at the d4 then hop in with knight f7 or even knight h7 so understandably uh blatney uh didn't want any of that all right so knight d4 b takes and right here we can say that white is Obtain a clear advantage black who doesn't really have any uh, counterplay here and this position is very loose and it shambles Knight c2 Queen f4 and of course the rooks aren't that valuable with the files all closed up like this And again, there's no coordination really with the black pieces whatsoever and being behind in development and um having a lack of coordination with the pieces that are developed combined with the uh central pawn preponderance of white the space all right uh black is in a lot of trouble here or we could even say almost lost at this point <clears throat> even at this point d takes e6 can be played here too but this is also winning and I can understand you at the New York Open so wanted to make sure so the game continues on it's castles and we'll just go through this rapidly so shout out to you if you're still here after an hour and 20 minutes but like I said feel free to watch this video uh, you know in parts but believe me, this video is going to do you justice uh, if you're interested in playing either side of the Owens uh, defense. This is the truth here, and please check out my other videos also. I uh, have videos like Grandmasters versus Birds opening, um, you know, different, uh, Trompovsky, Alexander Mor um, Albin, Calendar, uh, Albin Calendar Gambit, according to Alexander Morozavich, etc. Long videos like that if you're interested in really getting into some of these openings. All right, so P Pavel Blatney was completely crushed uh, basically um, soon after the opening uh, by uh, Ivanov. Again, we cannot blame the result in the opening. It was just the, the play of Black kind of deteriorated after about move 14 or so and um he played over ambitiously and uh, uh pretty much didn't create enough counterplay on the queen side and did not um take the proper measures to protect his uh king and um that will happen in any opening if you'll wind up getting crushed if you don't really take the um you know follow the basics and the principles in the beginning <clears throat> Moving on, <clears throat> 2001, Joe Gallagher versus a player named Shechekev, <laughs> 2543 with the uh, white pieces. Gallagher goes for this aggressive setup. Again, there's nothing wrong with this, especially once black commits to move like D6, you don't have to worry about the uh, bishop coming out anymore. To me, this is worse <clears throat> than... Uh, you know, then say play a move like knight f6 or something like that. Cause now you're you're cutting your own throat, so to speak. And this right here already, white has a nice, nice position. And he just starts attacking. Again, all he has to do here really is um, either open up the position if he can or maintain his uh, space advantage. Already we see that black has sacrificed the pawn just to get some counterplay. And it's like, why do all of that when you can um, just play normally? So here, again, he sacrifices, uh, he plays c6, figuring that um, Gallagher would just go back. And of course, if he plays knight c3, he'll be just fine. But it shows that his position is so strong that he can play a move like queen d6 so he sacrifices a whole piece but his central pawn majority is so strong and he has so much space that black can't even realize the fact that he has an extra piece and that's why I showed this game 
okay? Because what I'm trying to say to you is that the peace sacrifice on D6 is not even sound. But it's white has so much space in the position that black cannot like capitalize on the fact that he has an extra piece. And <clears throat> white just simply opens up the position. And you can see he just crushes white. He has, uh, excuse me, he crushes black. He has the king exposed. And again, white uh, doesn't allow black to really get out of the starting block. And at this point now, it's totally lost. His black's piece is all uncoordinated. And uh, black was forced to resign. So again, that's like a brutal lesson. And you gotta get, you gotta, you gotta play chess. You you only can allow your opponent to get give take give get so much. It's like if you give everything to your opponent and you have no counterplay, you're gonna get blown off the board, especially by a strong player. And that's what what happened here. You cannot give this these type of positions up like with that uh, that easily. Um, okay, so moving on. This will be the last game that I show you. Um, this game is from 2001 and between a player named uh, Coke, who's rated 2507, and uh, J.M. DeGrave, who was rated 2589. This is an example of the position uh, transposing into a similar looking uh, position to that of the Rui Lopez, which I had mentioned earlier when speaking about the flexibility of the opening. And here's a good example of that. So after the opening moves, um, here we are, move five, black goes with the move uh, E5, which we don't, we haven't seen that often here. D5, giving up space, and we enter into a position that looks like um, certain lines of the Roy. So Bishop B4 check. King just decides to slide over rather than trade pieces. H4. And we can see here very similar um, to uh, certain um, variations of, say, like the Zaitsev variation of the Roy uh, Lopez. Again, I would say here, as I've said in other games, the position is equal. It's up for grabs. All right. It's more of a strategic um, game going forward and about finding positions that you are more comfortable in. Yes. Does White have more space? Of course he does. Um, if I was to pick a side, I would like to play. I'm taking the White side here. All right. It seems like White has a little more prospects, whereas Black has more of the um, prospects of just holding the position. He's not lost, but he's not really um, causing uh, White to lose any sleep here. Okay, continue, and we can see all of the uh, thematic Rui Lopez ideas. You know, with the ideas of switching the knights to the uh, king side, occupation of f4, uh, etc. We have this open c file for Black. Fortunately for Black, he's not getting quite enough counterplay here. And uh, here he plays this move, uh, a5, and decides that um, he's willing to give up the exchange here, which black does not take for some reason. And I'm thinking the game is this game has to, there, there he goes. He finally takes it. Um, but I'm wondering if that's a mistake. And here we see just some brutality on the queen on the king side for black. Um, and this is things that happen in the Rui Lopez. Of course, he doesn't take. So he just plays knight 6 to h7. Bishop drops back. Um, now, if I'm attacking, I'm not playing bishop e3. I'm going back to d2. I'm keeping that bishop on the board. But that's just me. That takes e3. Again, I'm just going through this quickly. 
you can see black just trying to hold on here and white is holding all the cards and went on uh, to win so let me give my general conclusion of what I think about this opening um again I think to reiterate I think the the uh, Owens defense has uh, definitely good surprise value I don't think that it's an opening you will want to play all of the time because your opponent can definitely uh, prepare uh, prepare for you and probably get a, a good position um, when we're talking about like amateur levels of course it's playable uh, I hate when people say oh that's not playable or that's unsound yeah maybe at the, the top grandmaster levels you know above 2500 that you really can't afford to have that in your repertoire like on a regular basis but at amateur level almost anything is is uh, quote unquote playable um, you could play Latvian counter gambit for goodness sake and have good results or or uh, King's gambit um, you know uh, Scandinavian you don't really see that too much at uh, top levels right at amateur level that's the fun level you can play play all types all types of stuff you know the uh, birds opening and wing gambit and all of that type of stuff and have fun with it but for purposes of this survey and um, looking at all of these grandmaster games as you can see uh, I did not pick and choose games I just went win in order um, a lot of the games recently are more like blitz games and things like that and I didn't want to include a lot of blitz because again there's a lot of mistakes and anything can happen uh, the classical games to me give a true uh, picture of what what's going on in the opening as far as strategy and problems and things like that and I just think that again developing the bishop so early uh, to such a committal square like that just gives um, white uh, uh, um, you know uh, uh, opportunities to shut the bishop out of the game on many occasions as you've have seen it's basically you're just walking into a, a, a problem that you have to solve right and sometimes you saw some games where the player was able to play a bishop a6 and trade off the bishop but again it's like why take on a problem when you don't have to right um, another thing is that again giving up the space that early in the game all right you have to be able to do something about that center and tear it down and I didn't see again when when white plays moves like Bishop d3 and uh, Knight d2 I didn't really see adequate response from black that's satisfactory as far as like being able to like, um, create enough counterplay against the white center I've seen white stabilize the center a lot even advance the center creating these uh, advanced um, uh, French defense uh, type positions where white was able to um, develop an attack and win the game I also saw some um, games where black try to play in some type of hedgehog position where he doesn't even allow the dark square bishop out he plays d6 and e6 and g6 and just gets absolutely crushed again due to the space advantage given up uh, in the opening so my conclusion again at the top levels of of this opening is I understand completely why you don't see it that much it's just not um, it's, it's just not adequate again as a, a regular again I emphasize a regular guest at top grandmaster level can it be played at the amateur levels? Of course. You know, whatever, 2,500 and below? Yes. Yeah, at your Saturday tournament? Yes. So don't get in the comment section saying how you play it at your club and you have great results. Now understand that. What I'm saying is there's a reason why you don't see it at the top levels. It's not because somebody doesn't know about the opening or they haven't discovered something yet in the opening, etc., etc. It's just that the strategies for white okay or a little bit of head of the defenses that that black has available all right there's too many problems that can be created for black and I noticed also and even in the positions that are equal again like that 
position from the Rui Lopez. Black suffers from a lack of uh, counterplay and ideas. Um, I think that's another thing. If you want, especially in the modern chess time, you you need openings to as black where you have some kind of counter chances or where you can give white something to think about, not where you're just holding off for dear life and just hoping for white to make some kind of egregious error uh, where you can uh, capitalize on like the uh, Gallagher uh, Manasian game. Uh, uh, I think it was, or Peter K. Wells, I think it was, where he sacrificed he sacrificed a piece and uh, wind up um, losing the game. I mean, Black uh, did not have a good position that game, but again, he was able to bait his opponent to making a mistake and he won it like that. So again, we don't judge by result. We're looking at the position and we're ascertaining why the opening is not played. Or again, as the video is titled, Grandmasters versus the Owens defense. And so I've gave my my reasoning and conclusion. So it's up to you to decide what you think uh, about uh, this particular opening and why you only see it right in rapid games and uh, blitz games uh, nowadays so with that i hope you enjoyed this video please like and subscribe comment down below um and uh please support my channel via donation in the link below and um again i'll see you guys on the next video and if you have any uh likes or uh openings that you want me to go over in like fashion uh you know just